roll one with Jeffrey Grado. Survivors of the Shoah Visual History Foundation. The date is October 29, 1996. The survivor's name is Jeffrey Graydow. The interviewer's name is Merle Goldberg. We are in Los Angeles, California, in the United States, and the language is English. <clears throat> My name is Merle Goldberg. Today is Tuesday, October 29, 1996. I'm conducting an interview with Jeffrey Gradow in English in Los Angeles, California. I'll try my best to look at her. <laughs> okay. All right. You ready? First of all, can you tell me your full name as you are called today and spell all the names? Yes. Jeffrey Grado. J E W F R E Y. Grado G. R A D O W. And can you give me your full name as you were give the name you were given at birth and spell all those names for me? Chaim Gradovich. Chaim C H A I M. Last name G R A D O W I C Z. And can you t give, tell me your full birth date? January 5th, 1925. And in w what city and country were you born? I was born in the city of Mlawa, M-L-A-W-A, -A, Poland. And if I were to look at the map of Poland, where would I find Mlawa? It's northwest of Warsaw. The closest city is Poznań, P-O-Z-N-A-N. It's close to the German border, Prussia, or Prussia, but the they pronounce it. It used to be a Borders town. And while you were growing up in Malava, did you have any um, nicknames or any, were there any terms of endearment that anyone called you? No. You were just Chaim? Chaim, that's it. Okay. Um, now, from now on, um, just <coughs> Just to mention, you don't have to spell everything for me now. Okay. The reason you don't have to is that it'll break up the interview as you know the flow of it. It'll you'll be saying something and all of a sudden you'll start spelling and it'll be I see. it'll be awful. So just you don't have to spell anything anymore unless I specifically ask you to do so. Okay. 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 Well, to begin with, um, why don't you tell me about uh, your family? Uh, I know we had a little discussion about this last week, and I was wondering if you could tell me if you knew how long your family had been in Malava or even in Poland in this part of the world, on either both sides, both maternal and paternal. Well, I can only assume that they, they were for generations. Uh, both uh, my parents were born also in Poland. Uh, my mother was born, I believe, 1902, and my father was also born at, and he, in the same year. Now, there might be a difference in a few months, but I don't know exa exactly when they were born. Also, my grandparents were born in Poland, and my uncles, the whole family, they were all born in the same city. And uh, I would say at least a few generations. There were some uh, from the family also immigrate to the United States in the beginning of the, 19th, of the 20th century, which I met them after the war. But otherwise, I would assume that everybody was living in the same town or in the vicinity in maybe 20, 25 miles. My mother's side, uh, she had another sister, and also family, and a very close-knit family. When you're speaking about someone, and, and I just should preface this, 
you should always use their name so we'll know. For instance, you know, if you talk about an aunt or a, a sister or brother of either of your parents, always say the my. name of you know the name of the person so we don't get confused. You can say my aunt, but you or my uncle or a sister, okay, yeah. but always use a name. Um, so as you were talking about your parents and talking about when they were born, could you tell me your? Why don't we start with your father? Why don't you tell me his full name and uh, a little bit about him, what he did? Well. My, my father, uh, his name was Chemo in Hebrew, or Nochem, the call it in Polish. Uh, he had two brothers. Uh, one was Avrum or Abraham, and the other one was David, which were very close. We used to meet on a, almost a daily or bi, bi weekly or weekly uh, in our home. My grandfather was a very religious uh, person. He was orthodox. So all his life, I would say, or maybe half of his life, he was in, in a shul, in temple. And uh, uh, we were an average working family. And that was before the war started, actually. Uh, I had two sisters. One was Shana. One was Dina. Dina was the older one. I was the oldest in the family. Uh, when I saw her last, she was approximately either 11 or 12 years old. And my youngest one had to be eight or nine years. The last time I saw my uh, sisters and the whole family was uh, in 1939. But we're getting a little ahead of ourselves here, okay? Let's go back a little bit. You said that your grandfather spent, this is your father's father, spent yeah. half his life in shul, but you didn't tell us his name. Boruch, Baruch Gradovich. And did you know your grandmother, his wife? No. I don't know what happened, I mean, I never saw her. What about on your mother's side? Why don't you tell me your mother's full name and her maiden name and a little bit about her and how uh, her uh, name was Fela or Feiger Volarski. And uh, she had also a sister, but very seldom. We saw, we saw her only when I was a kid. Uh, her sister and her whole family were living in a small town. I don't even remember the name of it. Not too far. We were not too close because we, we did not see him. And uh, it's uh, all perished in, in the uh, camps. Now, I was wondering if you could tell me about your father. You said that your grandfather was such a religious man. Did you also come live in such a religious house as your no. grandfather? So tell me what Jewish life was like for you. Well, uh, we were average, I would say. Uh, on Saturdays, naturally, we had uh, dinner on a Friday night. We made Kiddush, you know, the blessing. Uh, but my father was entirely different than, than my grandfather. He was more progressive. He belonged to, to a labor party. I think it was called Bund, if I'm not mistaken. It was more like a socialist party. I don't know. I'm not uh, too uh, knowledgeable about those things. And before the war, I mean, uh, he had uh, his own uh, shop. He was a shoemaker. And he uh, naturally took repairs, made uh, shoes, and during the week there was a market where all the small uh, merchants used to uh, get together, and the farmers used to come, they used to exchange merchandise. Uh, but uh, it was a happy family. It wasn't a rich family, but... Uh, Average family. Now, the question is, what's average family? In my case, uh, we all uh, lived in a small house on a major street. Uh, it's called uh, Warszawska Ulica, meaning Warszawska Street. We were maybe about three quarter miles from the school. Miles or kilometers, pardon me, we used to use kilometers, not miles. And Naturally, I was the oldest one, so 
uh, winter or summer or spring, rain or shine, we had to walk to school. There was no such thing as transportation to school. And no parents would pick up the kids from school. And uh, it was a, a, a public school, but o only Jewish kids went to that school. There was another public school where all the uh, Christian kids went to school. We were entirely different. We were apart. I mean, I, I, it's hard to understand in the U.S. what means you got two public schools, one for Jews and one for Christian. That was the system. And uh, I was a, a good student. We used to, uh, we used to uh, during certain lessons, we used to go outside, play in, in, the, in the back here. We had a big field, almost, almost like I have a farm, where the kids used to go out. We used to plant and uh, all kinds of vegetables. So we understood how we get our food. But the uh, sanitation uh, condition were not too hot at that time. We had to walk at least maybe 500 feet or more to a bathroom. And it was just made out of boards. And that was acceptable. My teacher was the same teacher I had it from the first grade till, till the seventh grade. It's not like the uh, United States. Uh, they, they keep changing. Uh, the uh, professor from the school was the same one for all those years I went to school. And the school, it was on the same street uh, where I used to live. Now, uh, during holidays, we used to get together, uh, my uncles, my grandfather, but I never saw my grandmother, so I don't know what happened. Either they were separated or she passed away, I have no way of knowing. But it was a happy family, and uh, until the war broke out, before the war even, <clears throat> we used to see at least two years before, since it was a border town, north of us was uh, Ostpreußen, or Prussia, whatever they call it. It was part of Germany, and two years before, the Polish army was building almost like a Maginot line. We couldn't understand what's going on. We could see uh, big tracks cement going day and night until the war broke out. But before the war broke out, um, let me ask you, what did your mother do? You didn't say that. You oh yeah, my mother was a housewife. She did not work. She was taking care of the kids and uh, uh, living in a, in a town. It's primitive. She had to cook and wash and clean there's no such thing as going in a market and buy all the stuff. She had to walk maybe a, a, a few hundred yards to buy a, a bread or a challah. We had uh, stores in the city, but uh, some people could afford it and some could not afford it. We were lucky at that point. Um, my father did make enough that we could live comfortable. So for instance, you know, Getting back to Shabbos, for instance, in the preparations for Shabbos, did your mother make the challah, or did you go to the bakery, or how did it, how did the no everything was uh, cooked and baked at home. They had the old-fashioned ovens, and she used to she used to uh, bake the challah, and what else over there? She used to uh, uh, certain food item used to put in in the oven prepare for Saturday, for Friday night and Saturday, because mostly on Saturday we had to eat cold because we could not uh, uh, warm up. Even though we're not too religious, but my mother will not dare to warm up or cook anything on, on Saturdays because my grandfather kept an eye on it. Now, was uh, that her father or your father's father? Uh, no, it's my uh, father's father. And what My, about my uh, mother's family... I knew very little of it because, I don't know, it was very hard for transportation to get, so they stayed away. A small city maybe would take maybe an hour, an hour and a half walking uh, time, but uh, very seldom we would see them. And where did they live? In what city, do you know? It's a small town. It's, uh, was it a shtetl or was it really a... It's a shtetl, well, I don't know, it's called a shtetl or whatever, I mean, but it's very small. I don't even, uh, I never paid any attention. 
Did you? What kind of um, kosher laws did your fa did your mother keep? We observed uh, uh, st strictly kosher laws. Uh, you know, if you had chicken, you had to go to to the uh, what do you call it um, the shoichet, and you had to be kosher. I mean, naturally. Now, if something happens, I have no way of knowing, no knowledge of that. Uh, I wonder, were you bar mitzvahed? Yes. What was your bar mitzvah? Bar mitzvah was very simple. It's not like over here, like in the United States. Uh, on Saturday, you say the prayer, the bruche, and uh, you, the older people got some glass of wine. They had some herring, and it's it's simple, just like you. It was no big deal. We never made out uh, any big deal of it. And that was the whole, the whole balmisr. There you? was no dancing or singing could do, just just religious service, and that's the end of it. Did your father give you any kind of advice on your bar mitzvah day? Do you remember? No, he was not too, uh, too religious. I mean, it's, I don't know. It's, it's such a big difference between my father and grandfather. It's unbelievable. And uh, I never got any advice uh, as far as religion is concerned or anything else. How about from your grandfather on your birthday? Grandfather was a different story, but I used to go to Haider. So naturally, he was more interested in, uh, in checking on me. If I go to Haider or I study, uh, and he told me, I remember, you have to go every, every Saturday at least, you have to go to the temple. But as far as uh, mixing in and our uh, family life, he never did. He stayed out. What about <clears throat> anti-Semitism in Malava when you were growing up? This is before the war, I'm talking. Yes, yes. Um, did, it, uh, did you encounter or witness any kind yeah, of... Uh, yes, we did. Well, that's why they had... First of all, they had separate schools to keep the kids apart. Uh, there were some fighting even during... Uh, the market day, well, there, there used to be some really anti-Semitic poles, and they will try to destroy the Jewish uh, merchants, throw, not hurting him uh, physically, but throw down the tables. They used to have a table, and on the table used to be shoes or clothing or anything else. They used to just knock it down. The police stayed out, but there were also some um, left-wing uh, Poles, which came in, and before you know, we're starting a whole fight. Used to be not all, very often, but w once in a while it happens. Did you actually ever witness this? Or was well, this I was afraid I just ran away. When we could, see, I used to come over to see my father, but when they made a noise like that, I took off. I was a fast runner. Because you said that um, your family was comfortable, I guess. Yes. Was your mother very philanthropic? I mean, when on the holidays, did, was there sadaka? Did she invite poor Jewish families in to, to, uh, to eat with you? Not too often, but uh, from time to time, we used to have some guests in our house. It was very poor or rich. I have no way of knowing. And what about a radio? Did you have a radio? What's a radio? We didn't know what a radio means. We have no radio, no television. There's no such thing as, as a radio. We didn't have, let's put it this way. In our family, we never had a radio. How about, was there any Yiddish theater in your town? Yes, there was a famous uh, theater. Uh, they used to come from Warsaw. What's the name? It's a Yiddish theater. I don't remember exactly what. But uh, once in a while, because there was a big Jewish population, I would say maybe 50% or more were Jews in Mulava. And also there's one uh, famous Jewish writer, Apatosho. He was born... In, in Malawa. But uh, it's all this thing happens before my time, but they were talking always about him. So in terms of the Yiddish theater, <laughs> there must have been Yiddish life. In yes, there were uh, lots of organizations, Zionist organization, Bund organization. There were some also uh, extreme left organization, like a communist party, uh, whatever they, because when they had the uh, war in Spain, the civil war, I remember my dad told me that some 
some of the people went to fight even in Spain. Not to, there were a few, a few, a few young men who volunteered to fight in Spain. Jewish men? Or? Jewish men, yes. Did you know them? Uh, no, but I just know for what my father told me. I've never heard that. Before. Oh, yes. And also there were some Christian also. There must have been a communist. I don't know exactly. I couldn't say it. But I know that some of the people went to fight in Spain, young men. Like the Americans did. I don't know. Yeah, there were Americans. They were called the Lincoln Brigade. So it was the same idea. There was the International Brigade. Um, at that time, now that you're speaking of 1936, yeah. the reason I asked you, you have, if you have had a radio was because some people did. No, we and, did not. And if they did, there were things they heard on the radio. And that's what I was trying to get. No, I didn't know it. All I know it is from my father told us, I think once at the dinner time, that certain uh, people, which he knew about it, went to Spain. Since you lived so close to Germany, obviously once Hitler came to power, there must have been a great many German Jews who were trying to get out. Did they come through Malava? No. You see, um, I would say approximately 25 or 30 percent of Polish citizens were German descent, the called Volksdeutschen. And uh, uh, we didn't know about it. We, we know there was a church, a German church, there was a Catholic church, and there was a, a temple. We had also small, they had uh, temples, which uh, the religious Jews used to sit over there day and night. I mean, it was unbelievable. And we used to, as kids, we used to run over and see what's going on over there. But we never dared to go inside. But... Well, I guess, but you don't remember people coming through, German Jews co coming through? No. Once, after 1933? No, I was too young. I wouldn't know about it. I even Malava was a major uh, thoroughfare from um, Eastern Europe to the Baltic Sea, which is Gdynia or Gdańsk. Uh, Gdańsk or Gdynia, supposedly supposed to be a free city, but unfortunately... It was, uh, was mostly German, because I met some people who were living in Gdańsk after the war. And uh, they told me it's just like in Germany. I know you didn't have a radio, and, you didn't, and there were no TVs in those days, but were there, were, were there movie theaters in your town? Yes, we had one movie theater. Did you ever go to the movies and see newsreels? Yes. Mm -hmm. I once remember I, I didn't have the money to go in, so the door was open a little bit in summertime. There was no air conditioning. And I, the first time in my life I saw uh, a black woman on the, sh uh, on the screen. I couldn't understand. All of us, all kids, about, about six or seven kids, we always looked in. We should take a look. There's a black woman over there. We didn't know what it means because we never saw a a any black people. And it was also, uh, what's her name? Uh, she played in, 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 as a child in a famous, she was in the United Nations, I forgot the name of it. Oh my gosh. Shirley Temple. Uh, Shirley Temple. Shirley Temple, yes. And that was the film. And uh, I do even today remember, that's the first time you saw it. But in the movie theaters, were newsreel, if newsreels were shown, did you see newsreels about what was, ha did you see how a uh, film about Germany and Hitler coming, no, do you remember No, no, I never like saw that? anything. In fact, we didn't know what's going on. I didn't know, let's put it this way. I couldn't speak for somebody else. Uh, we were too young. We were playing uh, soccer, that was our game. And in winter time, uh, you know, it was cold over there. I so we made our own uh, sled. And we played around with kids. We, we didn't think about politics or anything else. We were too young for that. What about your sisters? What did you do with your, what did you Oh, well, my little sister, well, like, young little sisters, I mean, very little, they were staying with mother. They always were attached to, to mom. Oh, once in a while, they used to come over to me. We used to go and play, uh, try to play soccer. We never played any, actually. But uh, they were little kids, I mean. And it's not, uh, they didn't have the luxury of, of uh, going out. Oh, once in a while, we used to go to the park. There was a park in the middle of the city. We used to walk around uh, with the parents. But uh, otherwise, nothing special. 
I can uh, now after 50 years I can hardly remember all I remember my little one she used to stick to me like glue she used to gra grab me by my slacks you got short slacks in summertime and but otherwise I have very little I know that since your family was was comfortable in that summer before uh, Poland was invaded in that summer of 39 was your, did your family take a vacation together? Did you go any place like Zakopane? Did you do anything? No, no, but uh, I used to go with the kids uh, to a camp. We made a Jewish camp. It was maybe three, four kilometers from the city. We could walk away because all the way around the city were woods, heavy woods, mostly, well, palm, uh, not um, uh, um, Christmas tree. Yes, and also birch trees, and there, that's the place we uh, used to uh, stay for a, for a two, three weeks. And was it a sleepover camp, or was it a day? Yes, it was a sleepover camp, but very primitive. They had small, made out almost of plywood or whatever it was, and we were sleeping about eight, ten kids in one place. But we had supervision. And your sisters also attended the camp or no? Uh, my older one uh, attended, but not the younger one. My older sister, which was almost uh, nine or ten years old approximately. Her name again? The name of the camp? No, your sister's name. Oh, Dina. She was the older one. The older one. And Shana was the, the, the youngest one. And what was the name of the camp, do you know? There was no name of them. We just got the Jewish camp. Kept out of the city, that's all. There were no names. It was organized by the, uh, 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 the rabbi was over there, because we had a rabbi from, from Haider, and he supervised us. He was a teacher, actually. A young man, very progressive. So in the September of 39, what happened next? Where were you? I was at home, and early in the morning, we had a horrible explosion. It was September, this I'll never forget, it was September the 1st, and an artillery bomb exploded a few hundred yards from our house. We didn't know what's happening. Everybody was out, and then uh, we saw the uh, Polish soldiers going closer to the border, going up up north. There was the major forest phase, so they used to, they used to go over there. And we realized from mouth to mouth that the Germans invaded Poland. And uh, uh, they built the, uh, the uh, fortification before the war, so the Germans didn't, was not, didn't, didn't come into Malawa first. They were almost uh, close to Warsaw. And they, uh, we were encircled, but they came from the other side. Instead of breaking through, go straight ahead. They didn't do it. They came from the other side. They were close to war, so then they come back to us. And then we saw troops are coming in from the opposite side, not from the German border. Like, uh, uh, for example, from the north side, north of us was the German, German border. They came from the south side, from the major boulevard. Uh, light tanks uh, drove in, and we couldn't understand what's going on. Everybody was afraid, we were still sitting in a home. And beginning we tried to, to uh, get out of the house and uh, run to the fields but so it's worse yet so we got stuck over there in a farmer's house and that was the beginning of World War II but I, I went through almost two wars not one war because one war started September 1st 1939 and it was uh, Poland was partitioned east and west the eastern part the Soviet Union took over, and the Western part, the German took over, and we were under German occupation already. But why don't we just talk about you personally? You don't have to divide the war this way, and we're going to stop and change the reel and go on. Okay.
Okay, at the end of the last reel, one, you were just talking about the invasion in Poland, okay? Let me ask you, you, were, you said we ran to, out to a farm. Who's the we? Uh, my parents, my father, mother, and my little sisters and myself. Uh, we didn't know where we're going or what we do, but there were shooting going on. Also, there were some dropping bombs around us. And when we got uh, out of the city already, we, could, we, didn't, we didn't know where to go, go forward or backwards or go home, because German troops were all over us. But since we had small kids, they came over, they looked at us, they looked at my, my mother had a basket, I believe it was food. They looked inside and told her to go home in German. And, uh, and then we were on the German occupation. Beginning, we didn't know anything. I mean, uh, some of them were just regular human beings. And, um, they were not uh, bothering anybody until the local uh, Germans, the Volkswagen, start pointing fingers. And uh, a few days after they took over the city, they already had SS troops and they already gave orders what to do. They, hi they, used to, they used to take the young men to clean, uh, to clean uh, the streets. Uh, they used to also take them in and where they have the barns for, for horses, the Jewish man used to. I was too young for that, but I was a tall fellow, almost the height I'm now. And, uh, but I was, they didn't bother me, but after, a few weeks, my father, or probably uh, before that, my father went back, we all of us went back to our own home. He opened up uh, the windows and put in a signed shoemaker and he started fixing shoes for the German soldiers. So they used to, uh, gave him marks, they used to pay, and it was still uh, livable. It, we did not uh, see anything unusual except we saw different, different Germans, different uniforms. We said the Polish, we saw the German. They didn't bother anybody yet. And then we find a sign in Polish and German that the city of Mlava is changed to Milau. And they got a, a burgemeister or a mayor of the city was a German. And the city hall was changed to German. And it took maybe six, or so, I think September, October. By the end of October, my father had some kind of a disagreement with the local men. And they told us, some of the Poles told us, either they were Germans or Poles, you better watch out, they're gonna come to arrest you tonight. Uh, he had, my father bought a horse in a, in a small wagon before the war. I, it looks like my father knew already or prepared himself that something's gonna happen. We didn't know about it as kids. We were happy that uh, we have a horse. And either he wanted to take away the, that horse, whatever, anyway, it was a big disagreement and they were looking for my father. So somebody came over from the neighbors or, or I don't know exactly who, who it was. And I told them, you better get out because they're gonna come and take you today. And at night, we, I put on my clothes the way I'm staying now and my father, and we left our house. My mother and the little sisters were staying over there. We went, we walked maybe a half a mile, a half an hour, and uh, we got in uh, to a farmer. He probably knew that man, because he took it in, he, he, he gave us food, and told him, you stay over here, and tomorrow you're gonna go home. Unfortunately, next day, uh, we never went home, because one of his, uh, brother or somebody who went over there to our house and they told them that the Gestapo came at night to look for, 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 for my father. And since I was the oldest one, naturally my dad told him, you're coming with me. And we stayed overnight over there and the following day or two, we start walking away from Malawa. And we walked for almost two weeks mostly at daytime because at night was against the law to, to, 
to see civilians on the streets. And once in a while, we used to get a ride from farmers who used to go to the market. And the end of October or beginning of November, we got way east, close to the, uh, to the Russian border. It was Poland, but it's the part which the Russian, uh, the Russian army took over. And we, we came over there, and at night, at that time, we knew already that there's only one way you can go through the border illegally, is at night. And I was already knocked out from walking so much, but I was a husky fellow. And we met the first Russian patrol. Nobody speaks Russians. I spoke to them Polish, and somehow they understood me, and I tried to be the interpreter, and they spoke Russian, but somehow we communicated with our hands, and what we told them that we are Jews, and they told them, go down over there. So they kept us over there and near the border, on the Russian side already. There were no German uh, uh, patrols close to the border. We saw them before, but not at the border. They didn't care if somebody wants to go to uh, over on the other side to the Soviet Union. And they, uh, they took us over there. There was a woman. She spoke to us. I think she was some kind of military uh, or in, 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 in integration. No, she was in, in the woman talked to my father, but he couldn't understand, so I answered for him. And uh, she was surprised that I understand what she's saying. And they told her, you go straight ahead and you get to the city and you go to city hall. And we arrived at Bialystok, in the, in, in the city of Bialystok. And that started off almost like a chapter in our life. We never saw my mother again, or my sisters, or anybody else, or uncles, anybody else. Let me ask you something. <clears throat> I want to take you back a little bit for a little more detail, OK? Yes. If you can give it to me. When in, in Malava, was, yeah. no, in Malava. Yeah. Were there any markings? Were there were the Ger were the Germans making uh, any differentiation between the Jews and the rest of the, Chris and the Christians in Poland? Did you have any have to wear any specific markings? Beginning, which they didn't do it. When we were over there, they didn't have any yellow stars yet. It was not uh, we didn't know about it. They know the local population used to paint out this is a Jude. He lives over here, but they did not bother us the first few weeks in 1939. What about school at that time? School was finished. Uh, I never went to school back, or my sisters went to school, or Heide. That was, an, it was closed, period. It was taken over by the government. Either they had, they had uh, some kind of, of people over there, but uh, no kids went to school. Just Jewish kids or all kids? All kids. Now, the other schools, I don't know what happens, because I never went over there. But our school, where I used to go, was closed, and nobody would, would dare even to go over there, because we always saw a, a German, a German soldiers. Now, when a Polish person, a Polish Christian person, would point out and said, "This is a Yuda," would anything happen? Did you see any kind of? Uh... Sometimes they'll hit them. Sometimes they just uh, they'll just walk away. They don't pay any attention. The first few weeks, it was not too bad at all. I mean was a little difference between uh, the war in, in, in bef before the Polish government and the German government, except ourselves, we were a little bit start to be frightened. Why? I don't know. We never saw anything yet. And when the Germans <clears throat> arrived in Malava, Malava, I'm sorry, um, you were still young, so did they march in with their shiny boots or oh, how yes, was it? Well, you... Yes. When they came in, first of all, we saw a light uh, tanks got in the city and the center. After that, we saw some uh, very big, heavy Germans on motorcycles. There were two or three, depends on, on the motorcycles. And they took over some of the nicest homes over there. They, they put on their headquarters. 
They also took over the, uh, they were big farmers. They had a lot of uh, wheat and corn. They right away put up soldiers over there. They should not move it. Uh, but there was no fighting in the city. The only fighting was before, uh, on the first day of the, uh, of the uh, war, September 1st. Uh, they were fighting, we could hear artillery fire, we had machine fire, we could hear. Once I, I, um, all my of us dropped on it because it looks like a machine gun fire went through close by where we were over there. But otherwise, we didn't see any war. We saw already, there were already some casualties that we saw. We saw some German soldiers, and also uh, they picked them up right away. And there were some Polish soldiers who were laying already dead in the street. And uh, after a while, we saw uh, uh, they transferred uh, Polish soldiers as prisoners of war. We, we used to see uh, the big German uh, cars and inside of our soldiers. That was the beginning. Now, when you and your father made this journey east across Poland, I was wondering if you could tell me, you said you traveled during the day, but were the roads crowded with people? Were there? Yes, there was such a mix up that the Germans didn't even bother because some went east and some was going west. And they did not say at all. All they looked to see if, if you have a uniform. If you have anything, it, it will, uh, remind you of a uniform or something close, they will stop him. But otherwise, when you saw a young boy or girl and, and a man, they did not bother it. What about <clears throat> as you were making this journey east, were there any kind of low-flying planes? Was there strafing? Was there any kind of, were you ever in danger of losing your life due to any kind of? Yeah, the first few days when we escaped from lava, there were shootings, there were planes, there were, because we went through a line where it was a uh, wooded area, and there were German soldiers on one side and Polish soldiers on the other side, and we walked through the main highway, we didn't know about it, and somebody uh, took a shot, I don't know if, who it was, is it the German side or Polish side? In the air, it looks like, because if, if they would hit us, nobody would come out. And we went through, but they saw from a distance that uh, when uh, they see a man and a woman and children, somehow uh, they st still did not uh, bother to let you go through. Then we got closer, we saw uh, Germans with machine guns, those heavy machine guns uh, holding it like that, but they didn't bother us. Was there communication, were you able to, on this journey that you were making east, was there any kind of letter writing to your mother and your sisters, was there? Nothing, no way, the only thing my dad wrote something, and he gave it to the farmer who kept us overnight. And that's the last time. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's the last time I saw, I saw my mother and my sisters. It's when we left uh, the city. And till 1941, we never saw them again. And then we became on the... On the Soviet side, uh, we got in in, in, a, in in a city, Bialystok, we find an apartment over there, and uh, my father start, uh, opened up a store because people needed repairs. It wasn't a store that he's going to uh, sell anything, but rep just repairs, a shoemaker. It really helped a lot because everybody needed repairs. And then uh, some Russian soldiers used to come over, fix it. And that's the way we started off um, living on the Soviet side. But as far as my parents, my mother and sisters, that's the last time I saw them. Since you, there, obviously Russian was not a language either you or your father were acquainted with at the time, 
How did you even find, did, you had money, did you have, did, could you take lodging somewhere in order to? I don't you, know, I mean, but my father somehow managed to find a place, he made a deal with somebody that uh, uh, they opened up, uh, they needed uh, people to accommodate the public, I mean, and being a shoemaker, it was very, very important. If he would be something else, he could not do it. And we, uh, I think there were also a lot of Jewish families in Bialystok. And they used to call us Bieznik, or a, a displaced person. And they used to help out. And that's the way we started off. Now, while you were in um, Bialystok, this was when exactly? Do you this remember? was already in November of 39. At that point, were you able to correspond with your mother? Did your Was your father able to let, let her know where you were? Did you know? No, in 39 we could not. But uh, by 1940, my father wrote the first letter, and it was delivered to her by official mail from the Soviet Union to Germany. It went to Berlin and then went to, to Malawa. Uh, I started off going back to school. I, uh, I went into the Russian school and started to learn the Russian language. So I suddenly I became an interpreter. And not interpreter, I mean, for my father. For the, there were a lot of uh, uh, refugees, I mean, they escaped from Poland, but mostly they came by themselves. The, the wives and small children, they were left on the uh, German side. I, I started off school, it was really rough on me because uh, I didn't understand a lot of things and I had to guess, but somehow I managed. And uh, from November, Till, uh, till 41, I was in school living a normal life to a certain degree, but I was missing my mother and my, my sisters. My father was, was terrible with him. He could, he, could not, he could not take it on me that he left his wife and children. And at one point, he wanted to go back to, to Mlava. There was a registration in Bialystok that whoever wants to register can register and go back and bring the families, but it was a trick. My father did not register. He had uh, somebody else, and she had an, uh, one of his friends over there, and he registered himself to go back to Poland to bring his family. In the middle of the night, they encircled the whole city. They had the list of every every uh, person who wants to go back to to uh, Pol to Germany or Poland and they arrested them and they took them away. It, you need to be clear when you talk about they. Who took, who took the them? The Russian out? army or the NKVD or the secret police or whatever they call it. I don't know. They arrested those people at night. They put them in a big, uh, a big uh, uh, cattle trains. And they, and they all wind up in, in, in Siberia. Because they said, if you want to go back to Germany, you're a spy. That was the policy. But fortunately enough for me, my father did not register because he had, he had a feeling or he knew something which he didn't tell me that he cannot do it. But in 1940, he, he got contact with, with my mother and his sisters and uh, he worked with the local government and tried to get a passport that they should come over from Germany to Poland because those two years before the war, the uh, 1941 war started, it was a normal relation between Germany and, and Poland. And uh, my mother received a passport with the kids to come to us. And she was over there in, in, in Mlava, but later on she was transferred to a camp already, they organized a camp. And she wrote us, we have the passport, hopefully we're gonna see you soon. But they never let, let those people out. They, they gave him the passport, they prepared themselves, and they never let him go. And unfortunately, in 19, later on, I mean, we find out from different people that all those young women with the children were the first one 
to go to Treblinka. But during, uh, from 1939 till 41, uh, we got a few letters from Germany, from Poland or Germany, whatever you want to call it. And she was miserable for the whole family. For me as a young boy, and actually I still was in school, and even I wasn't miserable, but I was not happy either. I mean, because I know my sisters, my mother is over there, and the uncles and everybody else. <clears throat> and then 1941, in June, the Germans attacked us, and we were again on the, the Germans came in to Bialystok. And the fighting started off, and one of the Germans threw in a grenade where I was with my father in the house. And somehow they had big ovens, and I was behind. It's almost like a square box of ovens, and I was behind over there. My father was in front of me, and the grenade hit him, and it saved my life. And he was very, he was injured very badly. He was dying after uh, the house exploded, not the house, it was, the house went on fire suddenly. And there were a whole row of homes which went, uh, had the same problems. Some of them, people did not go out at all. They were burned in the homes. Uh, in in uh, my case, my father was badly injured and I was not injured and I pulled him out from the house. The house burned down to pieces, and I was, it was a field next to it, like a, they were growing uh, f uh, potatoes or whatever, and I pulled him in between two lines where, this, where they plant the potatoes. And the German went through once or so, it's, it's burning the street, the homes, the whole thing over there, the whole area. They left us, and I pulled them to the front, and then they took him to the hospital, they told me, you go, you go whatever you want, and we'll let you know. Next day, I find out my, my father was dead in the hospital from the injuries. Uh, there were some uh, older people, uh, Jewish people, uh, who came with me, and uh, we took him to the Jewish cemetery, and I was present when he was buried. Now, I was left alone. I didn't know what to do, but the family took me. A family took me in. They told me, you can stay with us. And they had, uh, they were selling corn, wheat, I mean, uh, farm products. And I stayed with them till about, that was June, till about October. But since I was already a grown up men in the, in the Germans' uh, eyes, I had to go, to, uh, they used to take me to, to work. Uh, but it used to be a school, was a headquarters from, from the German army. And we did all kinds of jobs, cleaning toilets, streets. Uh, anything, they needed help, they had <coughs> Jewish commanders. And, uh, and I was over there for a while. Then I was transferred to Baranovice with, with a group of men because the German army was going east, but the highways were so bad that they used to use you, slave labor, human labor, actually. Uh, we were Jews, and also they had prisoners of war already that they used to cut the trees and lay it down parallel and, uh, and build the highway so the, so the heavy uh, trucks could go through. And, you know, it's, it's, it's almost built on a spur of the moment as a highway. You know, there's plenty, uh, uh, it's wooded area, those streets, uh, those highways it was to go through. So you used to cut the tree on one side and the other side and lay it down to each other. Then you put in uh, uh, dirt on top so the uh, trucks could go through. There were a lot of uh, prisoners over the uh, uh, Soviet prisoners or Russian prisoners, and also in in, in the in the area over there were also a lot of dead people. Link, 
because they were fighting before over there. There were the Russian troops, and also there were big holes from bombs which exploded. And they used to, we used to, uh, we had to take some of the uh, human beings and we'd pull them. <laughs> <laughs> We used to pull those soldiers, dead soldiers, put them in in, in the uh, big holes and cover them up. And then we had to go back to work. Uh, they kept us for, for quite a while until we come to the main highways. This was a side highways because the traffic was so heavy with uh, with trucks and, and tanks and whatever you want. And the railroad were very bad, they were not modern, they were way behind. So everything was going to the front, going east. Uh, we could even hear still the artillery fire. Uh, if it was Soviet fire or, or German fire, I don't know, but they could hear the explosions. Or at, uh, then that, uh, when they, if you used to get up early in the morning, very little food, get a piece of bread, and walked all day long. And if you wanted water, you walk, you walk away, you walk in in the wood, there's no question if you get shot automatically. So they always kept an eye, an eye on us. On us, and there was in front of us, was maybe uh, 100 feet, 200 feet, were uh, prisoners of war. And they treated them the same way. In fact, they watched them more than they watched the civilian uh, men. Because we were just, Plain civilians wore civilian clothes. We had a, a, a shirt, maybe for weeks. We didn't know what means ch change a shirt. The uh, sanitary condition was was unbelievable. And uh, when you say it's unbelievable, what is the, can you explain to me what is unbelievable? You, uh, well, living in the United States, you compare how we survived. That no showers, no toilets, no basic let's say, a toothbrush or anything else we, a human being needs were not available. We're just living worse than, an, worse than animals. Food was very scarce. We get a little food is enough maybe for a baby we used to get for a grown-up man and he had to work a heavy labor. And uh, <clears throat> until it took us a few weeks, we completed that project it took us back to the to the camp. It was, it was not a concentration camp. It was a labor camp, in Baranovich, and we start. Uh, they started to expand the railroad station, but we had no uh, equipment, machinery, or something else. Everything had to be done by hand. They had a railroad track, and there were small tra uh, uh, small uh, cars on top. And we used to by hand pick up the sand and threw it in. And uh, that's the way we worked 12, 14, 16 hours a day. But the worst thing was until now, until that point, we had to uh, sh uh, pull those human beings, soldiers, put in, uh, we had blood on our hands, uh, threw them in, <laughs> in those ditches or, or those big holes. Mostly they try to use those holes which were bombs were exploded. When a bomb explodes, there's a hole maybe 50, 75 to 100 feet deep. We used to throw it in, just, just, just like, uh, like dirt, nothing else. Uh, now these were Russian or German soldiers? Or no, there were Russian soldiers. The dead soldiers were Russian. The Germans, uh, the dead soldiers or anything else, we never saw because they picked them up themselves. I have one last question before we change the reel. Yes. Um, were you living, from the time your father was killed, where did you live? This is what we'll pick up with when we begin the next reel. Okay.
Okay, you want to go? Go ahead. Did you slay this? Oh. <laughs> um, so we were talking about, I wanted to know about your father um, after he was killed. And you talked about the burial. Was there a Jewish cemetery? Yes, he was buried in a Jewish cemetery close to a fence. We had no marking, and one of the older men wrote down his name on a, uh, on a plywood with his name and, and when he passed away. Was there, I know this was a very difficult time and there must have been much chaos and confusion going on, but obviously there were burials going on. Um, were, there, were there traditional Jewish ceremonies? There's taking no such as thing as any any religious or anything, if a, a human being, whoever it was a Jew or a Russian or, or, or anybody, was just threw him in, in a hole and covered up, that was the end of it. There's no religious service at all. Now at this point you're in Bialystok, where, where your father is killed, yes. right? Yes. Were there bombings and everything going on around you at this point? Or yes, there were bombings after that. There was still fighting was going on. A lot of troops were still in the woods, Russian troops. And from time to time, you could hear the plane were flying overhead and the bombing was, uh, until they gave up or, or they killed him. I don't know what happened. But for you, now you were alone, obviously. Had you made friends by this point in Bialystok? No, well, I, I was, mean, kids, you're a, young people, there were young no men. Kids my young age. Men. I mean, mostly with men, we tried to stick together. And everybody had felt sorry for me because I was one of the youngest. Mostly the men were in the late 30s, 40s, approximately. But uh, uh, I was only 16, 17 years old. And once, you're, once you lost your father, how did you live? I mean, because he'd been the, the breadwinner. He'd made, had the shoe business. Yes. So what did you do? Uh, do you remember? Did you work with your father at that no, time? Did no, he teach no, you any I, of the shoe no, business? No, he did not teach me. I just was a schoolboy, nothing else. I just loaf around, uh, you know, play with, with young people out there. I got acquainted with some pe uh, local people, I mean, Jewish, Jewish families. Uh, when, uh, when my father, after that, when my father was killed or dead, I was left alone. And I didn't know what to do, so I was wandering in the streets. And then I know some Jewish families over there, which... Uh, I didn't know the names or anything else, but I just walked in. And as, uh, as, as soon as they saw me, they had also children. They told me, come in over here, come in. And they told me I can stay with them. And there was one family. They had quite a few people already. Uh, they used to call them Bieznikis or a displaced person. And they ha somehow were a well-to-do family. And they were, we had, the older people used to work over there in the, they had big barns with corn and wheat. That, that's the family I, I was living over there. And when you worked in the burial detail, which is what it sounds like you were doing. No, that was, that, that was a little bit later after that. But, okay, so this time in Bialystok, you were just existing, is that? Would Just a, a, a regular laborer like everybody else. Forced that, by the Germans? Yes, definitely. It was not a ghetto yet, but we had to show up for work. We used to get, I think, some, some cars. We used to buy some bread or some food we used to get for that. And uh, after a few weeks, we had to show up every day in a certain time. Where? In, in, in the headquarters from the German army over there. I mean, was it in the center of town of Bialystok? Or it was, was it a little bit, like on, it used to be a school over there. So they took over the school. And that was the, the uh, I don't know if it was the headquarters, or just a quarters for, for the German uh, troops. And in 1942, they already transferred us to, uh, uh, to Baranovich. And when they transferred you, what, how did they make this transport? What were you? We, were, uh, we put it in, 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 in cars, in the military uh, uh, trucks. 
and they, they brought us over to the station, to the station where they kept the uh, slave labor. They were camps from uh, prisoners of war, big camps already, and we were the only civilians. And they, we start building, and we start building the station. But in the meantime, that also, they took us out to dig uh, uh, graves. It was ditches. We didn't know what the heck we was going to go in over there. They were already uh, catching some, either they were soldiers or partisans, they used to call it. We didn't know who they were. They had no insignia, no military insignia, except they had uh, Russian uh, uniforms. I mean, in other words, the clothes was, looks like military. Were they uh, soldiers or were they uh, partisans? I don't know, but they used to say partisans. And almost on a daily basis, they kept a few, they bring them out in a cemetery. It was a Christian cemetery, a big cemetery. And they shoot them. We were staying maybe 15, 20 feet behind. They told us, you go over there. And sometimes we maybe couldn't see it. So we used to, we used to almost lay down on the floor. When they shoot them, we had to complete the job, meaning what? Some of them fall in in the holes, and some were outside. We had to throw them in, and some of them were not even dead. And we used to point out that the man is not dead. One of, one of the officers used to go with a pistol and finish him up. He shouldn't suffer anymore. They were almost dead, but he still his body still moved. So they used to... Uh, give him an extra bullet or shoot him in. Yeah. And this was almost on a daily basis. Uh, later on, it was summertime. <clears throat> uh, they took a big group of people. We should uh, prepare big ditches. So we assumed that this must be some other killings. And that particular time, that day, there were a lot of uh, high-ranking officers I don't know the ranks, but I saw with the insignias, the whole thing, there must be big shots. And they took a whole group of, had to be prisoners, because no ranks or anything else on, on their body. There were at least 70, 80 soldiers, and from both uh, Russian soldiers, or Russian prisoners, or Russian partisan. They used to say it's partisan and they uh, brought them over over there. On one side was a small hill. They took off, uh, everybody had to take off the shoes and the clothing. They lined them up. On one side was the uh, prisoners, on the other side was a, a regular so, uh, German soldiers. Was, there were no machine, they didn't use machine guns. They used regular rifles. And some of them, I could see, um, they were crossing themselves. Some didn't do nothing because they were so exhausted that they didn't ask. They were waiting they should, should, should get shot. And finally, we could hear the, the shot from, from all those rifles. We were behind over there. And it was horrible. So many young men were all killed. They, they were all were uh, killed. And some fell down in the ditch. Some were still on top. We had to push them down. And we didn't know, uh, are we next? But uh, somehow, luckily, it looks like the human mind works different. We did our job. And they brought us back to the camp, to the labor camp. After that, uh, knowing what's going on and seeing what's happening, I made up my mind, I'm not going to be one of them. And uh, they took us back after that big uh, execution for, uh, for about a week or 10 days. They didn't take anybody to the cemetery either they stopped shooting for a, for a few days, or they were usually uh, gathering 
a bigger group, if they, cat, if they used to catch in, in the woods one or two, they used to put them in the prison. Was a, they made a prison in, 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 the, in, the, uh, in the building because we used to go in the building, so we know what's going on. On top of the building used to be machine guns, and they used to t take us, since we were all civilian, we didn't know what's happening, so we used to carry the ammunition, those boxes, way on top, on the top roof, because they were expecting some uh, some uh, attack from partisan or whatever. There were already uh, uh, groups of partisan or or ex-soldiers that did that did not surrender. And and at that time the situation changed. They were more careful with, with, with shooting because everybody knew what was happening that particular day. And we went back to work at the station over there, digging dig the sand, filling it in those cars. And at lunchtime, they were already, uh, uh, pardon me, I, I have to go back. Mostly those soldiers who were watching us were older Germans. They were not the young fellows like they were going to the front, but they were watching us and building that station. And during lunchtime, uh, they, they give us a little freedom, the civilian, not the military. And uh, we used to uh, sneak out, go around, look what's going on. We used to go over there close by were also as uh, farmers, small farms, uh, farmhouses. We used to go and beg for a piece of bread. Sometimes they, they prepare some bread for us. Sometimes they tell them we don't have any more. And then I find out that there is uh, maybe a couple hundred feet from me was a May a major street going to the airport where the camp was in one place because they kept us because they were building the new station and not too far was the airport maybe a half a mile a mile uh, one day when people were going to the market I, I knew already that there's a certain day it was middle of the week the farmers used to bring uh, food to the market in exchange for goods or money I don't know and there used to be a lot, of, a lot of people walking in the street. At noon, I decided, oh, also we had already the yellow stars. And, uh, and I took off the yellow star, and I went through a small place where there were a few trees already, and I saw that people are walking. I just ran first in between those old people, across the highway, and I took off. Nobody knew about it because it was still lunchtime. One was laying in one place, one the other place. But after lunch, every day they used to count if you have all the people. And that particular day, I went on the highway and I saw uh, some cattle over there. And a young boy was over there. So I ran over to him and I, I told him, the whole, where, can we go? where can I go over him? He showed me the hand, don't go that way because there is the airport and there's Germans. You go straight down, and maybe you will be lucky. He he didn't know if I'm a Jew, or 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 a, a Russian soldier or a prisoner, because I had a, a jacket from one of those dead people. Unfortunately, I put it on because we had no clothes, and when we took all the clothes when they were shooting, after that we used to bring it back to the, to the to the uh, headquarters or or a camp or school or whatever it was over there. So one of them was a German told me, why don't you put on one? And I took one. Because I was on <coughs> almost half naked. I had no clothes. And that particular day, so he looked at me. He didn't know if, I, if I'm a Russian or whoever I am. And he told him, go. And that day, I took off fast. And I went over the highway. And I went in close to the woods. There's an awful lot of woods. Wherever you go, there's wooded area over there. You have a farm. Fifty feet away, there's already trees or a small, small uh, woods. And I took off. And but uh, half an hour later, I could hear shooting in the air from from uh, uh, rifles. It looks like they find out that one is missing, so they had to make a report. I find out later on. They told them we caught them who escaped and and we killed him. That was me. Because somebody else uh, did the same thing. But once they find out, I, I escaped. And I walked uh, the half a day, the night, 
once I went away from the big city, there were lots of farms. I got in one place and I knocked at the door, please give me a piece of bread. And she said, shit, Jew. I don't know, either she got scared or she didn't know who, what it is. And I ran out, I didn't wait what she's gonna do. And I know that in all those small places, there were already local police that worked with the Germans, collaborators. But I ran fast, I went again, I, I, another street, but always tried to go close where I saw trees, not the wooded area. And I got in over there and all night, I walked around in the woods, a half a day and a, and a night. I didn't know where I'm going, it's just luck. But I could see in the woods already uh, signs like arrows cut in the trees. So I assumed there must be some partisan someplace. But do I go in the right area or not? I don't know. And suddenly, in the middle of the night, came down raining with buckets. You never saw anything in your life, such heavy rain. And I got to a farm over there. And I knocked at the door. And the farmer told me, come in. <clears throat> he let me sit at the stove. That was the heating system. He told me, you go ahead, go in, 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 in the uh, stable over there. Lay down a little bit. I'll wake you up. And it, we were already far away from the city already. But he told me, you have to take off early in the morning because Germans come over here and they cut the trees, they need the wood. And after that, I got up in the morning. I felt really good already because after a, a, a half a day and a night, running and running as, as fast as I could, he directed me to an area. He told me, you will meet some friends of yours, partisans. I didn't know what partisans means even. I had no guns, I had nothing. I had no military training. Even if somebody would give me a gun, I wouldn't know what to do with it. But anyway, I went over there, and on the second day, maybe it's a half a day, a night, and the second day I came to an area was heavy woods, and I could see the people are singing, and they already were, they were not afraid. And I came over and asked him, where is the, the headquarters? Where is the partisan? They showed me going to that building over there. I came in over there, and there were some partisans with guns, the whole thing. They were, uh, they were, they were already fighting, fighting people. So they, they saw me. So one of the officers told me, how old are you? Where are you from? And, you know, I started in t in t to find out what I, they were doing. So I told them, look, I was working in a camp, and I escaped. I'm a Jew. He looked at me because there were uh, cases where somebody uh, escaped and the Russians were killing themselves or shooting themselves because they were afraid. He looked at me once, twice and told me, you go down that highway over here. It's not a highway actually, it's a, it's, it's a small way to go in deep in the woods and there is, a, 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 there is some Jewish camp and there were a family camp. And I got over there, they were really surprised. There were, uh, there were already patrols, Jewish patrols.